in physics and material science. Plasticity describes the deformation of a material undergoing non-reversible changes of shape in response to applied forces. In engineering, the transition from elastic behavior to plastic behavior is called yield. Plastic deformation is observed in most materials, particularly metals, soils, rocks, concrete, foams, bone and skin. However, the physical mechanisms that cause plastic deformation can vary widely. At a crystalline scale, plasticity in metals is usually a consequence of dislocations. Such defects are relatively rare in most crystalline materials, but are numerous in some and part of their crystal structure. In such cases, plastic crystallinity can result in brittle materials such as rock, concrete and bone. Plasticity is caused predominantly by slip at microcracks. For many ductile metals, tensile loading applied to a sample will cause it to behave in an elastic manner. Each increment of load is accompanied by a proportional increment in extension. When the load is removed, the piece returns to its original size. However, once the load exceeds a threshold, the yield strength, the extension increases more rapidly than in the elastic region. Now when the load is removed, some degree of extension will remain. Elastic deformation, however, is an approximation and its quality depends on the time frame considered and loading speed. If, as indicated in the graph opposite, the deformation includes elastic deformation, it is also often referred to as elastoplastic deformation or elastic plastic deformation. Perfect plasticity is a property of materials to undergo irreversible deformation without any increase in stresses or loads. Plastic materials with hardening necessitate increasingly higher stresses to result in further plastic deformation. Generally, plastic deformation is also dependent on the deformation speed, i.e., higher stresses usually have to be applied to increase the rate of deformation. Such materials are said to deform viscoplastically. Contributing properties The plasticity of a material is directly proportional to the ductility and malleability of the material. Physical mechanisms Slip is a shear deformation which moves the atoms through many interatomic distances relative to their initial positions. Twinning is the plastic deformation which takes place along two planes due to a set of forces applied to a given metal piece. Most metals show more plasticity when hot than when cold. This property is of importance in forming, shaping and extruding operations on metals. Most metals are rendered plastic by heating and hence shaped hot. Slip systems crystalline materials contain uniform planes of atoms organized with long-range order. Planes may slip past each other along their close-pack directions, as is shown on the slip systems page. The result is a permanent change of shape within the crystal and plastic deformation. The presence of dislocations increases the likelihood of planes slipping. Reversible plasticity on the nanoscale The primary plastic deformation in simple face-centered cubic metals is reversible, as long as there is no material transport in form of cross-glide. Shear banding The presence of other defects within a crystal may entangle dislocations or otherwise prevent them from gliding. When this happens, plasticity is localized to particular regions in the material. For crystals, these regions of localized Plasticity are called shear bands. Plasticity in amorphous materials Crazing in amorphous materials, the discussion of dislocations, is inapplicable. Since the entire material lacks long-range order, these materials can still undergo plastic deformation. Since amorphous materials, like polymers, are not well ordered, they contain a large amount of free volume, or wasted space. Pulling these materials in tension opens up to these regions and can give materials a hazy appearance. This haziness is the result of crazing, where fibrils are formed within the material in regions of high hydrostatic stress. The material may go from an ordered appearance to a crazy pattern of strain and stretch marks. Plasticity in martensitic materials Some materials, especially those prone to martensitic transformations, 
the form in ways that are not well described by the classic theories of plasticity and elasticity. One of the best-known examples of this is nitinol, which exhibits pseudoelasticity. Deformations which are reversible in the context of mechanical design, but irreversible in terms of thermodynamics. Plasticity in cellular materials These materials plastically deform when the bending moment exceeds the fully plastic moment. This applies to open-cell foams where the bending moment is exerted on the cell walls. The foams can be made of any material with a plastic yield point which includes rigid polymers and metals. This method of modeling the foam as beams is only valid if the ratio of the density of the foam to the density of the matter is less than 0.3. This is because beams yield axially instead of bending. In closed cell foams, the yield strength is increased if the material is under tension because of the membrane that spans the face of the cells. Plasticity in soils and sand soils, particularly clays, display a significant amount of inelasticity under load. The causes of plasticity in soils can be quite complex and are strongly dependent on the microstructure, chemical composition, and water content. Plastic behavior in soils is caused primarily by the rearrangement of clusters of adjacent grains. Plasticity in rocks and concrete in elastic deformations of rocks and concrete are primarily caused by the formation of micro cracks and sliding motions relative to these cracks. At high temperatures and pressures, plastic behavior can also be affected by the motion of dislocations in individual grains in the microstructure. Mathematical descriptions of plasticity. Deformation theory There are several mathematical descriptions of plasticity. One is deformation theory where the Cauchy stress tensor is a function of the strain tensor. Although this description is accurate when a small part of matter is subjected to increasing loading, this theory cannot account for irreversibility. Ductile materials can sustain large plastic deformations without fracture. However, even ductile metals will fracture when the strain becomes large enough. This is as a result of work hardening of the material, which causes it to become brittle. Heat treatments such as annealing can restore the ductility of a workpiece, so that shaping can continue. Flow plasticity theory in 1934, Egon Orowan, Michael Polanyi and Jeffrey Ingram Taylor, roughly simultaneously, realized that the plastic deformation of ductile materials could be explained in terms of the theory of dislocations. The more correct mathematical theory of plasticity, flow plasticity theory, uses a set of nonlinear, non-integrable equations to describe the set of changes on strain and stress with respect to a previous state and a small increase of deformation. Yield criteria. If the stress exceeds a critical value, as was mentioned above, the material will undergo plastic, or irreversible, deformation. This critical stress can be tensile or compressive. The Tresca and the von Mises criteria are commonly used to determine whether a material has yielded. However, these criteria have proved inadequate for a large range of materials and several other yield criteria are in widespread use. Tresca criterion This criterion is based on the notion that when a material fails, it does so in shear, which is a relatively good assumption when considering metals. Given the principal stress state, we can use Moore's circle to solve for the maximum shear stresses our material will experience and conclude that the material will fail if where sigma 1 is the maximum normal stress, sigma 3 is the minimum normal stress, and sigma 0 is the stress under which the material fails in uniaxial loading. A yield surface may be constructed, which provides a visual representation of this concept. Inside of the yield surface, deformation is elastic. On the surface, deformation is plastic. It is impossible for a material to have stress states outside its yield surface. Huber von Mises criterion This criterion is based on the Tresca criterion but takes into account the assumption that hydrostatic stresses do not contribute to material failure. M.T. Huber was the first who proposed the criterion of shear energy. 
von Mises solves for an effective stress under uniaxial loading, subtracting out hydrostatic stresses, and claims that all effective stress is greater than that which causes material failure in uniaxial loading will result in plastic deformation. Again, a visual representation of the yield surface may be constructed using the above equation, which takes the shape of an ellipse. Inside the surface, materials undergo elastic deformation. Reaching the surface means the material undergoes plastic deformations. It is physically impossible for a material to go beyond its yield surface.